crowd. I can't get them up here for anything. <laughs> all right, well, first of all, welcome uh, to Toxic Google. I'm Angela Corton. I'm a VP in YouTube marketing. Did you say Toxic Google? I said to <laughs> <laughs> Rain. Talks. Talks at Talks Google. Talks at okay. Google. Yep. I need to learn to enunciate. <laughs> it's like, um, what was that movie where she, the rain in Spain yep. falls mainly on the talks at Google. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, it's the, this is Gen Z. They won't get that reference. All right. Um, okay, Rain. I would say that most people know you as Dwight from The Office, although I've read your bio now, and you're much more than that, but you're still Dwight from The Office. So. <laughs> And he's actually a prolific YouTuber and probably one of the OGs at YouTube. He started a company called Soul Pancake, which was really about doing and putting good into the world. I remember um, Kid President was one of my favorites. Sold that to Participant. And has sort of been on a path to understanding and perhaps rethinking spirituality and religion. And is here today to talk about his book, which I had the pleasure of reading over the weekend while my daughter was chasing Pokemon and the Promenade. So thank you for that. Called uh, Soul Boom. I've got lots of stickies over it, but uh, it's really an interesting time to be talking about this rain. So why don't we dive in? Why write this book and why now? Yeah, I think that the number one question that people ask is like, why the hell does the guy who played Dwight writing a book on spirituality? It's, it's, yes. it's, it's, a, it's a weird kind of assemblage of ideas coming together. And uh, it's a super Im important question. And there, there's a number of different reasons. Uh, one is that I grew up a member of the Baha'i faith. And why that's important is that Baha'is uh, incorporate lots of spiritual ideas and religious ideas from all faith traditions because Baha'is, I feel like I'm really ignoring you people over there. How's it going? <laughs> Um, uh, Baha'is acknowledge the essential truth and divinity of all the religious practices. And so as a Baha'i, we read Buddhism and we would read the Bible and we would read the Bhagavad Gita and we would talk about these kind of essential ideas. So uh, that has very much informed my life journey and my life story because I was grew up in that Petri dish of deep, radical, meaningful, fascinating spiritual discussions and life's biggest questions like why are we alive and do we have a soul and what is the meaning of life and is there a God and you know these gigantic questions you know we didn't talk about golf and recipes at the dinner table we were talking about this kind of stuff so that that influenced me uh, a great deal and in fact Soul Pancake uh, which uh, had some good success on, on the old YouTubes uh, back in the day. We had ultimately over a billion video views and uh, about 4,000 pieces of content. And uh, uh, our, our main focus was chew on life's big questions. Because I think that the big questions of what it is to be a human being are what connect us and they what, they're what bind us. And it doesn't matter what side of the political aisle you're on or a blue state or a red state or what culture you come from, you know? The meaning of life, do we have free will? How does love work? Uh, what, is, what is the mystery of consciousness? These questions kind of propel us forward. So that's part one. Part two is I, in my youth, had a lot of mental health struggles and I've talked about this and this is getting a, a lot of attention in the press for some reason. I don't quite understand why, but I, I'm, I'm realizing that because people don't really talk about their struggles very much. I'll talk about a struggle and it'll be like front page news and it's like slow news day, seriously? We all struggle, everyone struggles. Guess what? Even Brad Pitt has struggles, you know? Um, actually, he doesn't, but... <laughs> Actually, I think Angelina might she have struggles. She has bigger struggles. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, you know, I, 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 I dealt with a lot of anxiety and depression and uh, a lot of other issues in my 20s that um, brought me a lot of despair and a lot of deep questioning about my life path and kind of sent me on a journey to re-explore these central 
faith ideas because in the 90s, there wasn't much, I didn't know anyone in therapy and I was broke and I was a theater actor in New York City and we didn't talk about this stuff very much. So I, I kind of thought, well, maybe because I had at that point jettisoned uh, being a Baha'i or being spiritual or religious or thinking about any of that nonsense, um, I thought, well, maybe, maybe I'm I'm missing something. So, so that's that's another part of it. And the, and then the last part, because I could spend this whole session just talking about this question, but I'm going to wrap it up real quick. The last part of this, and I have a chapter in the book that I know we're going to get to called "A Plethora of Pandemics," because I wrote this during the COVID pandemic. But I talk about how there's so many other pandemics uh, affecting humanity right now. Racism is a pandemic, really. And uh, income inequality is a, is a kind of pandemic. Climate change is, is a different kind of pandemic. And that these things, and the mental health uh, epidemic is a mental health pandemic. And uh, these problems need to be addressed not just through politics, not just through legislation, not just through policy changes and elections, but we have to look foundationally at where the source of the dis-ease of the imbalance is that is causing all of these pandemics that are really hurting us as a species of eight billion people on the planet. I mean, so one of the things that I took away when reading this book about that section on pandemics is, is there a thesis or a connection between the loss of spirituality and religion in what is happening? And and when we look through history, are there moments that are similar to this that you see that same sort of connection? Because I'm curious, we seem to be talking a lot about mental health and, and you know, it's a big crisis coming out of COVID. We'll say it was young people didn't have a chance to be connect connected. And we talk about connection as being a big part of that. But is there something bigger rooted in that? Like the systems that you talk about, do you think we're here because we've lost religion or become it because it's become politicized or we've lost spirituality or that we're seeking and we're not finding? Yeah, there's, there's a lot to that question um, and it's a long conversation. So I'm going to guess that most of the people in this room and watching are part of the nuns, the largest growing religious movement in the world, which is when you fill out a religious survey, it says none of the above. Um, and that's the largest group for young people is, is to be part of the nuns. Uh, and, uh, and I imagine there's some people of, of various faiths uh, in here as well. So it's a tricky conversation because I want to acknowledge the evil that religion has perpetrated in the world and the trauma that it has brought people, both on an individual and fami family basis and like culturally. Mm -hmm. um, some of the greatest evils uh, that have ever happened on the planet have been done in the name of an all-loving God or an all-loving Christ or an all-loving Mohammed or whatever. And, uh, and this is, is absolutely heartbreaking and, and horrific. So want to acknowledge that. But what has happened and, uh, in Western secular society is, because I've experienced this in my own personal journey, and I was mentioning to you right before when we were speaking in the other room, like, have we thrown the spiritual baby out with the religious bathwater? We have so jettisoned anything and everything having to do with religion, morality, um, that community, God talk. Um, God is something that young people really struggle with. God is just so intrinsically interwoven with an idea of a patriarchal figure that is judgmental and is watching you to see what you're doing is right or wrong. That's so like interwoven. Uh, it took me years to kind of like disassemble that and unravel and, and redefine this idea of God. I have a chapter in here called the Notorious G.O.D. <laughs> um, uh, which was based on digression, which was based on a TV show that I pitched around town with Soul Pancake, uh, where I wanted to do an exploration of God in the modern world called the Notorious G.O.D. And it was rejected everywhere, um, <laughs> of course. And the best note was when we got from Netflix that they said it was, it's too controversial. It's like, so they can have like 
supermodels getting drunk and throwing garbage at each other on a reality show, that's fine. <laughs> but talking about God is too controversial. So um, that's where we're at as a society. So the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the question? Yeah. How about this? How about I connect it back to one of the things we talked about, which is... I was going to say something that was so important and brilliant. Is it a lack of spirituality yes. or Yes, so let me finish that. So, <laughs> so we've thrown the spiritual baby out with the religious bathwater, and there are a great number of universal truths about the human condition that have been explored for centuries, eons even, through the great spiritual teachers of the world. And uh, there is a great deal of solace, meaning, hope, purpose, belonging, connection that can be found in these spiritual teachings. And uh, I worry for today's young people in the mental health crisis that they're not turning to this reservoir of faith-based wisdom to help them on their journey. And that doesn't mean to become a member of any specific religion, and that's not what I advocate, although I do create a new religion in the book. We're um, going to get to that. Don't worry. Uh, but so I think that there are tools there that we can use and benefit from. And it's unfortunate to me that we have collectively had such a kind of like a gag reflex, knee jerk reaction against Ugh! anything having to do with religion that we've also kind of lost that essential beauty at the center of so many of those great wisdom traditions. So I just want to confess I'm a recovering Baptist and I converted to Judaism. So I have also my own religious uh, trauma and working through that. But you know, one of the things that you talked about in the book was that as you were growing up, you had two shows that really resonated with you that talked about morality and a bigger sort of picture of society, Kung Fu and Star Trek. Talk about those. And, and I want to make, I wanted to say this because I think it's really incredible that that's where you found a lot of sort of moral guidance. Do you think those things exist for young people today? And where would you s tell them to find those if they exist at all? That's a great, that's a really good question. And that's a really good one for my next book. Like what are the contemporary television shows that kind of, and pop culture phenomena that can guide us, you know, yeah. uh, in a certain way and, and, and show us the way. You know, people certainly respond to The Office for, I don't know why, I don't know, I don't get it. <laughs> it's, not, it's not that good. I mean, I'm kidding, it's amazing. <laughs> but they certainly respond to the, the, the heart-based familial uh, connection uh, that comes out of the show and I think that's what keeps people coming back. There's a there's a warmth and there's a love underneath the the joking that people connect to. And it's just a little bit, it's like three and a half percent of every episode and that's enough to keep them watching the episodes over and over again. Uh, but yeah, so st I'm gonna go to Star Trek and, and, and st Star Trek and Kung Fu. Um, so, I was raised by a television, much more than my parents. Um, and I loved so much of 70s TV uh, growing up. And Kung Fu is about this guy, Kwai Chang Kane, who is uh, raised in a Shaolin monastery. And he has you know, kick-ass martial arts skills. But he also has great wisdom, you know, Taoist and Confucian and Buddhist wisdom that has been taught to him. And then he goes to the Old West, and he's fighting all these racist cowboys all the time and, uh, and then navigating his life in this really cruel, confused, chaotic world. And uh, I view that as a, a synonymous with the individual spiritual path that all of us walk and that we must walk, which is to try and gain wisdom, to try and be find serenity in a chaotic and aggressive and uh, violent world to, to grow, to share with others our, our hearts and our path. And, um, you know, we all fight our version of racist cowboys that Kwai Chang Kane fought. On the, conversely, 
the other side of the Star Trek version is a side of spirituality that I think a lot of folks, and especially folks that are your age, uh, don't consider very much, which is um, the spiritual evolution of humanity as a species on this planet, as eight billion people sharing the resources of this planet. Because what's happened in Star Trek is that there has been a terrible World War III, and uh, it almost destroyed humanity. And out of the ashes of this World War III, humanity has essentially solved, through technology and diplomacy, uh, uh, all of its main issues, those pandemics that I talked about. So racism has been solved. Uh, the first interracial kiss in television history that was you know, banned in like 37 southern television stations was you know, on, on Star Trek. Because in the future, I won't say it was a colorblind world, but it was a it was in, in Star Trek in the world is a, a diversity inclusive world where we recognize the strength and beauty and wonder of the different races and classes and cultures and they're they're, they're beautiful flowers of a fragrant garden, you know, in the future. You know, sexism has been uh, eliminated. Uh, income inequality has been eliminated. And so humanity is then at peace with nature and with itself and then is allowed to journey and seek out new life and new civilizations and, and go boldly go where no, no one has gone before because we've worked out our crap at home. And this is the other aspect of a spiritual transformation that is really important to me it, and that is humanity using spiritual tools to mature and grow collectively. How, what do we do to serve the greater good? This is something that Gen Z and millennials are very involved in and active about and, and concerned with. How can their work, how can their volunteerism, how can their altruism, how can their philanthropy really help, you know, the environment move forward, help animals move forward, help help uh, disadvantaged human beings. You know, this is this is a generation that is more attuned to injustice than any generation previously, and a generation that doesn't really know what to do about it other than to send out angry tweets. You know, what what do we then do about yeah. that? Oh, sorry, I managed I mentioned Twitter here. Say is that okay? Well, no, threads just started. And so send now out angry threads. That's a different company though, right? That's right. Do you guys have it's a social media thing? No. <laughs> we have YouTube. They send out angry YouTube videos. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the collective, our collective responsibility to help humanity move forward uh, and, and to mature and grow and unify um, is part of the spiritual conversation and part of the spiritual journey. People don't really think about spiritual tools being used for collective action and for systemic change and for the systemic eradication of injustice. I like that. I like that a lot. Okay, I want to talk about science and technology and religion because you you, t you have a chapter in your book, because I think a lot of people can say, I can explain everything through science, or we can propel things through technology. But you are very much of the mind, as, uh, and you share a lot of work of other people, that these things actually have to coexist. Like, science is a part of spirituality, and spirituality is sort of fueled by science. How do you help us, like, how do you reconcile that? That things can be explained, or when they can't be explained? Like, how do science and spirituality, or religion, have sit side by side. Yeah, I mean, we could just talk about that question for an hour by itself. Um, but I will say that um, for me, it all rests in the mystery of of consciousness. Right. The hard problem of consciousness, as Dr. David Chalmers calls it, uh, this 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 stubborn fact that no matter how m neurological scientists try and do these crazy backflips to explain consciousness, they just can't. There, yeah, there seems to be some neurological activity when you're thinking and feeling certain things. But beyond that, the idea that we have this 3D movie experience of being alive that is mostly emotional mm -hmm. um, and that's connected to memory and um, that we seek meaning 
and beauty and truth and connection, that we write poetry, that we create great works of technology, um, hopefully trying to make people's lives better and not just make a, a, a lousy buck off of it. Um, but this, this experience of being alive, of hearing a piece of music or smelling a, a, a flower that reminds you of your, your childhood and being filled, your heart brimming with love and, um, and, and connection, th this can't be explained by science. So this is, and this is what eight billion people are having. They're having these 3D, you know, first person movie cinematic experiences of being alive. So I say that science um, is an amazing tool that helps explain the laws of the physical world. It is, both a system, it is both a system of understanding and it is also a library of understanding. Um, spirituality is everything else. Right. So it's not just kind of physiological psychology and neurological impulses, but the experience of being a human being, of, of love itself, of meaning, of seeking transcendence. Um, and yes, it, it comes down to the most dirty of all the words in the lexicon of spirituality and religion, morality, of how do we choose right and wrong? Is it just kind of what society generally says is right and wrong? Or are there some universal truths that perhaps come from some source beyond us? Uh, something that's not quite understandable. There's another, another there's a number of other mysteries that um, science not only can't solve, will never be able to solve. The mystery of how a bunch of chemicals on planet Earth all of a sudden sprouted biological life, and the mystery of the Big Bang. These are things we'll never fully understand, but I see them as two lenses to understand reality. So we have a physical reality and we have a transcendent reality and spirituality and science are not in opposition. They're both in harmony and they're both different ways of understanding the experience of being a human being. Yeah. I, um, I, I feel like I have spent a lot of my last couple years really focused on living in wonder and awe. And I remember there was a moment that we uh, did Andrea Bocelli, and it was Easter Sunday, and we did it at the Duomo. And all the cities around the world were empty, and it was quiet. And there was just a pause that you could sit in wonder and think that how could one thing bring such silence to this world, which was the pandemic. It slowed us down, it allowed us to go inward. And I kept thinking, it's incredible, like to, to this day, it's incredible to me that we even went through a pandemic, but that it gave us pause, and in that pause, so many questions we started to contemplate. But I go back to one thing, I think it was your theater teacher, Mr. Gregory, said about joy and about cynicism. And, and I, I actually wrote it down, like, do not give in to cynicism, don't do it, he pleaded. If you do, they will have won. And I'm curious, do you think we've given in? And where and how do we sort of inspire joy? Because even Brene Brown says the hardest emotion we have is joy, because there's immediately when you feel joy, you think it's gonna be taken away or that someone else should have it more than you. So when you think about this idea of cynicism and like spirituality, like you have such hope and joy and how do you maintain that and keep that as sort of central to your existence? And how do you help encourage more people to find and seek that? Yeah, that's a great question. There's there's so many studies out now about happiness, and I have a show on Peacock uh, right now called The Geography of Bliss, where I travel around the world looking for happiness. And uh, and it was such a, it was a joy to, to film, and went to Iceland and Ghana and Thailand and uh, learned some valuable, delightful things about uh, joy. In fact, my friend Ari Meyer, it was featured in the LA episode, if anyone saw it. She's a big celebrity back there. Um, but uh, so happiness is interesting and joy, this is a whole other conversation. Joy is different than happiness. Um, I, th I feel like joy is a superpower that you can harness yourself to. And it's something that you can, 
if you're not necessarily feeling it, you, it's something you can bring to the world. You can make a conscious decision to say, I'm going to bring joy, joy to the world. Um, all sounds the like boys a song. and girls. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, and that's a little bit different than happiness, which is a, a residual feeling that can't quite be recaptured. Uh, it's transitory and residual. So, uh, joy acknowledges sadness and suffering. So, I try and align myself with joy while knowing that suffering exists and I acknowledge the shadow and I acknowledge death and I acknowledge the fact that uh, things are, are really hard at the same time. So it's a conscious choice. But the story you, you bring up is uh, Andre Gregory, the famous theater director and actor and teacher and writer. and He's an amazing guy. He was in this movie called My Dinner with Andre from 1979, which is an entire movie with a conversation between two people, and you should absolutely see it, because it's as relevant now as, as ever. But he did, when I met with him, and I told him I was feeling kind of cynical and pessimistic and down, and how are things ever gonna work out? He grabbed my arm and said those things. He's like, don't do it. You have to keep joy alive. You've got to keep hope alive. Stay." You have to stay positive and work for change. If you don't, they win. If you're pessimistic, they win. If you're negative, they win. They, meaning like whatever the generalized forces of, of darkness uh, uh, are out there that are, you know, want humanity to stay suffering and ignorant. And so it's it's not really a choice for me. I mean that was that was that greatly affected me. And I'm by nature a pretty cynical guy and I have to kind of on a daily basis recalibrate my orientation, you know, and there's various ways to do that. Gratitude can do that. Meditation, reflection, contemplation can help do that. Connection to nature. But it's super important to uh, bring light to the world, joy, positivity. Um, that's that's really our that's our only path, really. But that doesn't negate suffering and death and 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 difficulty at the same time. And I think humanity is probably going to go through a lot of suffering and difficulty and death on its road towards its inevitable star traffic st star trekification. You've just created a new word. Yeah. It's a meme. Okay. Um, I want to just, we're going to take questions from the audience. So we have two microphones here when you're ready. I have a few more. So just stand up whenever you're ready and I'll grab you. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is you mentioned connection and I think it, w and happiness. And happiness, I think there was a Harvard study you mentioned that when interviewing the most, the happiest people on earth, connection was one of those things that everyone seemed to have. What do you think about connection in the modern world? Like, do you see we do it better? We could do it better? What are the things that bring you, you know, connected to more people? You're obviously here. Um, like, what, what can we do to foster more connection if that is truly sort of one of the pieces of happiness? Yeah, um, so the Grant study out of Harvard University is the most comprehensive study on human well-being that's ever been done. And it was over 80 years. It was about 300 people that went to Harvard. And they studied every aspect of them, their careers, their marriages, their children, their uh, health and wellness, the, their weight, their exercise, their church activity, what they believed, atheist versus theist, et cetera, on and on. And the, the, the scientists could boil it all down to, at the end of the day, just connect, only connect, as E.M. Forrester said. Um, live in fragments no more. And this idea of humans thrive in connection, and you talked about COVID, and one of the kind of big upticks in mental health issues around COVID was, again, disconnection. And we live in a, a world with a lot of false connections, right? So you can post a picture of you and your dog on Instagram and you'll get you know, 317 likes and you'll feel that immediate dopamine rush and feel like, oh, my friends like me and love me and they get me. But it's not a real, it's not a real connection and nothing beats uh, coming together and 
sitting shoulder to shoulder and, and sweating together and crying together and talking together and eating together. I'm going We're going to get that. We're going there. Um, so connection is, uh, is where it's at. Um, our devices keep us disconnected, but sometimes they make us feel like we're connected. You can be in a Reddit chat room about, you know, you know, your favorite Ford Mustangs and you feel connected to your community and in some ways you are, but nothing beats like going to a car show. I don't know why I went to that analogy, but, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's super important. So in the spiritual revolution that I'm framing in the book, a lot of it has to do with like building community and what can we do to build community, to bring people together, to bind folks together and um, religion is a, is a community. I mean, the, wor the root of the word is religio. Ligi ligio is like the root word of ligament. It's to bind, it's to rebind, to reconnect people. Religion has not been binding and connecting people. So it has been failing in its task to unify and provide hope, meaning, and purpose. But, you know, there might be some spiritual solutions along the way to doing that. But whatever we can do to build community, especially at the grassroots, to bring service into alignment so that we're getting out of being self-centered and moving into being other-centered, to moving to our altruistic uh, aspects of being a human being, not our selfish kind of self-aggrandizing one-upsmanship, hyper-individualistic way of living as we are in the modern world. Uh, community, cooperation, and connection. So you actually dive a little deeper into soul boom. So soul boom is like your 20 steps to building a, a modern religion, but not religion, but what what inspired those 20 things for you to sort of order them and put them in this book and then write about it? Like, you, And I think it goes back to your work and study in divinity and maybe sharing sort of the best of what this revolution that you are sort of positioning and hopefully encouraging us to take. Yeah, so I, as a kind of a thought experiment in the book, I I create, uh, a, I, I have a chapter called, Hey Kids, Let's Build the Perfect Religion. And it's, um, I create Soul Boom the Religion. Uh, and I do it as a thought experiment. I'm not actually creating a religion. Uh, maybe I should. I pay better than, than this speaking gig, which paid me, <laughs> which paid me nothing. Um, I'll go to like a podunk college in Idaho and be paid to speak. I'll go to Google, <laughs> a trillion dollar corporation. And like, they didn't even have my tea or like a protein bar <laughs> in, the, in the green Somebody room. Somebody take this guy which to was like the a MK table. afterwards, please. You see how pessimistic and negative I can get? Just like that. Just like that. Where's the joy? Where is the joy? Oh, look at this. Wow. Thanks. We got three minutes left. I got my tea. When I spoke at Apple. Oh. Ouch. It wasn't the best pedicure I'd had, but. Um, what were we talking about? Oh, so I created this religion, Soul Boom, as a thought experiment because, again, if we have thrown the spiritual baby out with the religious bathwater, what is it that we could gain from looking at spiritual practices, religious faith traditions, wisdom uh, throughout the centuries? And I thought, you know, hey kids, like let's, you know, I, I got it. Everyone's like, ugh, can't be part of an organized religion. Ugh, can't think about God. Ugh, I don't wanna, ugh, they're so toxic and traumatized. And I completely understand that and at the same time, that's kind of an immature reaction, right? So that's not a very mature, arrived reaction. So what's the next step? Uh, you know, a deep breath and some exploration, some reading, some study, some contemplation. So, you know, I, the 10 of the essentials I draw from the world's religions, uh, the universality of the world's faiths. It's very easy to find differences in world religions and kind of say, well, Buddhists don't even believe in God and 
Muslims do, and it's all about God, so they're totally different. It's like, well, there's actually a lot of similarities if you dig a little bit deeper, if you look at transcendence and the journey of the soul and service to others and, and surrender. There's a lot of concepts, so I try and take some of those universal concepts from religious faith traditions, and I pull them together with, uh, with some new ones as well. And uh, just, again, it's, it's to get people thinking a little bit differently about both religion and spirituality, because it should be mentioned that those are two different concepts, right? We I should have kind of started that way, that spirituality is anything having to do with, you know, the heart and soul, the divine, the divine qualities, the, the divine qualities that we all share, compassion, kindness, humility, love, etc. And then religion is a systematized way of organizing and understanding our spirituality. Um, there's a quote that I often uh, bring up, and in fact, it's one I think I taught to Oprah, so you're welcome, Oprah. And that is um, from Père Teilhard de Chardin, a Jesuit priest and philosopher. And uh, he said, famously, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. Um, and I just love that, and that kind of frames m my work and, and thought. Uh, where every day I deeply consider myself to be a spiritual being, and I've got, you know, 70, 80, 90, 100 years in this magnificent body, <laughs> um, and then it will fall away, and my uh, journey will continue. All of our journeys will continue in some way, shape, or form. We don't know exactly what that looks like. Every faith tradition, everyone has some kind of philosophy about the journey of the soul or the the essence um, and um, so that's an important uh, part of the conversation as well and I think it's important for both mental health and spiritual and social transformation that we're all we're all children of the divine you know we're all little sparks of light in these meat suits uh, going about our journeys and uh, sharing and shedding light and service uh, to each other. And our journey is unspeakably uh, eternal and glorious. It is that. I, I agree with you on, on that particular point. I know we've got Celine here who wants to ask a question on this side. It looks like we've got one behind there as well. Hello. Hi, Rain. Um, appreciate your spirit in your meat suit. Thank you for being <laughs> here. Um, I have a question, and you've been talking about this um, throughout your whole talk right now, but if you were to give pointed advice or sit down with someone who felt like they just needed to restart their life, like everything had fallen apart, do you have advice for them? Like, what would, Where would you start? What would you say? Therapy. Um, great question. I, boy, that's, that's a deep one and a profound one uh, and an important one. Um, the first thing that came to mind is uh, there's a wonderful writer, uh, Father Richard Rohr. I don't know if anyone has read any of his books. Yes, there's a fan. Uh, R-O-H-R, I believe is how you spell his name. And he is a Franciscan monk as well, and he has a, a center in... Um, in New Mexico called the Center for Action and Contemplation. And it goes very much in line with uh, the great spiritual teacher and leader Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, who passed away recently, whose work is incredibly profound, maybe my favorite of the last hundred years of spiritual writers. But this idea that there is, there is a yin and yang aspect to spirituality, which is contemplation and action. So. I don't know what to say as someone like rebooting their life, but you have to, you would need to bring meditation into that in some way, shape, or form. And uh, you don't have to get an app or you don't have to go to a class. You can, but you don't need to do that. It can just be quiet reflection on a daily basis, um, turning inward and finding a way, maybe through prayer, maybe through connection with nature to kind of recharge your spiritual batter batteries. And then the action component, so that's the contemplation component, the action component is to do one small act of selfless service every day, 
to cheer someone up or call someone who's down or um, give something to someone that needs something to be given uh, to just try in a very, very small way, one step at a time to make the world a better place. And that this then also recharges your batteries in a different way. You go back to the contemplation, you're able to give more. So as that process goes along, your contemplation gets deeper and your service gets stronger. And that's where I think humans find thriving. Hi, Rain. Uh, my name's Colleen. Um, I kind of followed a similar path that you talked about with growing up Catholic, throwing the uh, spirituality out with the religious bathwater, um, and then eventually kind of came to realize that I could have a spirituality outside of this religious tradition that I grew up with. Um, but when my daughter died, I found that there were two things that were really missing from that approach, and one was a lack of ritual, and the other was a lack of the community that I grew up with, the religious community I grew up with. So I'm just curious, as you have gone on these journeys yourself, how do you find um, spiritual community uh, outside of traditional religion, and how have you found um, ritual outside of those spirit uh, religious traditions? Yeah, great, great question. And I'm sorry about the loss of your daughter, and um, I think that uh, life is about a great deal of grief and suffering and difficulty and struggle, and we survive it better in community. Uh, for me personally, I'm a member of the Baha'i faith, and so I find great um, solace in participating in my spiritual community as well. As far as ritual goes, Maybe it's because Baha'is don't have many, if any, rituals. I'm not really a ritual guy, but I definitely see the power in collective action of, um, you know, and doing things together as, you know, there's there are rituals, like I come from the theater and I did theater for 10 or 12 years before I did any film or TV. There's so many rituals in theater, uh, you know, you, the audience comes in, the curtain comes up, the lights, the the make believe. Um, so I, I think there is a certain there is a certain power there. That's not one that I connect to personally as much. But um, uh, I think there are people are coming together in lots of you know interesting ways. And there's you know I think the twelve step program is an amazing mm -hmm. kind of uh, ritual and community based spiritual church it's the it's the greatest and most successful spiritual movement of the last hundred years and uh, that's that is a a church where a lot of people find incredible meaning purpose connection as well hello is this on oh it's on um Hi, thank you for your time today. Uh, so I'm also on the boat of uh, humans thriving in connection. And for me, like something that's really important for me to connect with other people is food, like breaking bread is like super important. And I think you two were about to allude to that at some point. Um, could you maybe talk about, I mean, is, is food also like <laughs> a really important well, thing? Well, so thank you. <laughs> it's actually maybe, um, so the 21st bonus sort of um, peace to rain soul boom religion is the potluck. And if you've ever grown up in church or you've ever had to like do a family dinner, Shabbat dinner on Fridays or just in general, like a family dinner night, the idea of a potluck, people bringing something was something you grew up with and you wanted to be, you thought it would be the critical component. And I actually think breaking bread and the idea, and maybe that's ritual, but my question to Rain was actually, I want him to travel the world doing potlucks, inviting people, just perfect strangers, to bring a dish and share. Because I think that ritual and that connection, that unity over food and culture and experience is sort of, uh, has always been a part of my religious experience, whether that is spiritual or practicing. So you just gave me an idea for a, a cooking reality I, I show. I am actually <laughs> pitching. I'm, you, you that is, own. yeah, the, the great potluck challenge or That's something right. where chefs bring or aspiring chefs bring their, or just people. their dish but or regular people. show up at your home. This yeah. is what your house was like. My dad would always make um, a recipe he kind of invented, which was 
wow, I can't believe this was it. It was a layer of uh, tater tots and cream of mushroom soup and cheese and bacon bits. Bake at 350. Where did you grow up again? Just remind people where you Suburban grew up. Suburban Seattle. So, um, but he came from the Midwest, That's so. Right. Uh, it's a very well, Midwestern. Yeah. So that's that's what I remember from potlucks. But yeah, so I think breaking breads, bread can be very powerful, and that is a ritual. Uh, people want to eat, they like to eat, they connect over eating, and um, uh, and uh, yeah, it's a it's it's a it's a beautiful thing, and the whole idea of of sharing food and and even um, a friend of mine was talking about the various churches he had belonged to over his life, and then he said. But at one point in time, I was a Methodist and in the South, and my wife got hip replacement surgery. And every single day, a church member brought oh, a hot dude. dish over. Uh, and he said it was like so powerful. It was incredible every day. Ding dong. Hey, I brought you this a salad casserole. or this casserole or whatever. Like, like that's, there's, that's something that's beautiful. You know, we don't really do that anymore. And that's... Uh, we kind of be like, yeah, I called Grubhub and I sent over uh, some chicken wings from Wingstop to your house. And But uh, yeah, so th I think there's a lot to be excavated around people breaking bread together. Nice. Cool, thank you. Invite me to a potluck, please. <laughs> I think it's a thing. Thank you, Rain, for being here. Um, is there anything major on your current reading list or must read list that you can recommend for us that's inspired you? Um, yeah, I'm reading, uh, Elvira's autobiography. Mm. No one knows who Elvira is. Yes. Yes. You do? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. It was just <laughs> silence. You could hear a pin drop. Um, no, I, I am actually, but I like to read a lot of different books at the same time. But yeah, there's, um, uh, there's, a uh, well, there's a book I just ordered on Amazon that I'm so excited to get into. But I haven't read it yet, so that doesn't answer that question. I really uh, and just enjoyed uh, Arthur Brooks' book called From Strength to Strength. He's a professor at Harvard and, uh, and a great uh, speaker about happiness. Um, that was pretty profound. And uh, yeah, that was, that was great, From Strength to Strength. It's a little bit more, I'm, I'm a little loath to bring it up because it's a little bit more for people over 40. You know, it's a way of thinking about from strength to strength, like you have your strength in your first 40 years and you have your certain strength in your next 40 years. But it's still uh, a very valuable read. Hi, thank you. Um, first, just a quick comment. I wanted to thank you for naming kind of the religious institutional trauma that so many of us uh, have experienced in our lives. Obviously not all of us, but so many of us. As someone who grew up in a country where religion and government are very much intertwined, that's a little bit of my story. So I had my stepping away from things and, and my way back in was through healing my own kind of autoimmune stuff. What was your way back in when you said you kind of stepped away from the faith in your 20s and what brought you back? Well, I needed, personally, I needed to get over my God hang-ups. And I really took the question very seriously. And I was frustrated by my friends in the 90s because I would ask my friends if they believed in God. And they would, everyone was very vague. So everyone was like, yeah, kind of. I kind of believe in a force that's greater. I'm not an atheist atheist, but I, I definitely don't believe in a, you know, I call him Sky Daddy in that, you know, <laughs> I don't believe in a Sky Daddy. Um, Did you trademark that, by the way? I should. <laughs> I saw that. Yeah, I tried. Um, <sighs> but God will smite me down <laughs> if I do. Um, uh, yeah, so, but I, I was like, I really need to know if there is a God. And I, I kind of felt like I equated it to like being pregnant. Like you can't kind of be pregnant. Like you either are or you aren't. I feel like it's God is the same way. There either is uh, an all-powerful, creative, beautiful force that ignites and binds and inspires physical and emotional and spiritual reality, um, 
or there's not, and we're just a random assemblage of molecules and all of this incredible beauty and technology and, and love and memory and music are just random byproducts of, for some reason, there's just this physical universe that exists. It just, for whatever reason, there's just a bunch of stuff. Um, so it's one or the other, and uh, one of, part of my process was uh, reading a lot of books of Native American spirituality, and I was reading about the uh, Lakota Sioux idea of uh, Wakantanka, which is the name for a, a god or higher power, which literally translates to the great mystery. And I love this idea of the great mystery and the Wakantanka, and the idea that God from the Lakota Sioux is inherent in nature and only knowable through nature, ultimately unknowable, beyond time and space, but it can be witnessed through the kind of metaphorical interactions with nature of the heat of the sun or the, the, the strength of a mountain or the power of a wind or the, the changes of the four seasons. Like this is how we get to know the great mystery is kind of through the portal of nature. And um, I felt like for a long time in my life, I didn't believe in God, but I did believe in Wakantanka. Mm -hmm. So that allowed me to kind of like get past any sky daddy ideas about God. And I, in the book, I talk about how God is much more akin to something like love or beauty than to any kind of dude or Zeus or Thor or someone with a beard and superpowers. But uh, I believe in love. I believe in beauty. So I that opens a portal. I believe in, in the power and beauty of nature, that opens a portal to me to, to be able to believe in, in God. And that started me back kind of on a religious and spiritual path. Thank you. Hey, Rain. Thanks for being here. A lot of the circles that I swim in are all about high performance. You know, one of those being Google. And I would, you know, assume by all measure, you're seen as a high performer in your field. Just curious if you see any relationship between spirituality and high performance. Yeah, um, that's, that's great. So, uh, so I, I, you know, just, just what I, I believe is that um, over the course of my life, as I have had a deeper sense of mission, vision, belonging, and meaning, it has those those uh, belief systems have catalyzed within me um, uh, a gr greater access to greater powers. So I didn't know, you know, my friend Kevin is here and we used to do theater in New York back in the 90s. Like, I didn't know when I was this nerdy, mostly unemployed theater actor in New York that I would be capable of writing a book or producing shows or hosting shows or speaking at Google or or anything like this, I, I didn't see that kind of that capacity. But as I very slowly over the decade kind of harnessed myself toward uh, a mission, a vision of trying to utilize the tools that God gave me, and you don't have to believe in God, it used to be the tools that the universe gave you of, you know, cognition and, and imagination and creativity and love and, um, um, all of those powers that we're trying to harness, that I've been able to harness them to greater effect. So, but you, I have, but you, if you, you can't just do that without a sense of of being a part of something greater. And this is this is something that I really applaud. The millennials get a get get a hard time, like these ones. They're off to get their avocado toast. Um, uh, millennials are given a hard time, but. Truly, there's been a huge shift in millennials and Gen Z about wanting to make sure that their lives are in alignment with doing something positive and having some kind of meaning in work. I think it's tricky sometimes if you find all your meaning in your work, right? Because meaning is deeper than just work, and we live in this kind of productivity environment. But I think for maximizing oneself when you harness yourself to the winds of uh, divine purpose and vision and mission. Uh, mine is to tell stories, to make the world a better place, to entertain 
and to share spiritual tools for personal and social transformation. That's what I, that's where, that's what excites me. And um, I've been able to kind of ever more deeply kind of harness myself into that kind of, in that kind of work. But, um, um, yeah, but it's, I'm, I'm not completely saying it well, but, but it, you have to start at the very beginning, which is like, why am I here? And what am I willing to live for? And what am I willing to die for? Those are some very powerful words. Um, I would say that out of respect for the fact that I know many of you have to get to your next ones, I wanted to actually just close, because we're at, with a thank you. This has actually been a really, not just I've really enjoyed reading your book, but enjoyed your answers. But I always say, if you have a chance, start at the beginning and go to the end and see how an author sort of begins and ends his sort of story. And I'll just leave you with this. I hope you will all buy his book. Um, but when he talks about beauty and love, he starts his book with a poem by Mary Oliver. Uh, Instructions for living a life. Pay attention, be astonished, tell about it. He ends his book with a quote from Rumi. Love is the whole thing. We are only pieces. And I think like that is a very strong sort of alpha and omega, which is, I would just encourage, we, we work at one of the most incredible companies, the obviously one of the largest, but you know, to the point about productivity and about like being a sort of overachiever, don't forget that you're still living a life. It is still a gift. We're still here trying to make the world a better place. So thank you for showing up here. Thank you for Toxic Google for bringing rain to us. And rain, Toxic thank you. Toxic Google. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you very much.